All right. So my name is Jackie Werner. I'm scholarly communications and research librarian at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. And today I'm going to be talking about research data management, which is a massive topic and uh, one that librarians or researchers at all, a lot of us don't really want to get involved with it. But it's something that has, um, if you keep a few principles in mind, it's something that can make your research and your work much more organized and much easier. So, all right, here's about this workshop. And with this crash course today, uh, we're hope by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to define research data management and understand why we need it, and also follow general best practices in storing research data. So the first question is Wait, why- one moment, mm -hmm. Jackie, the poll. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Just to see uh, who's with us in our audience today, which may also help Jackie as she goes through her presentation. It looks like just about everybody has finished. So um, welcome to all the librarians in the crowd as well as the faculty and the staff. So thank you so much. All right. So uh, I'm gonna be going over why should you care about research data management and by dividing it into uh, three different areas, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's start with the good if it will let me go to the next slide. No, it won't. There we go. All right, the good. Uh, one, uh, a good part about research data management that's easy to understand is data as an asset. When you're working on doing research and publishing a paper, getting to that final uh, publication of research, uh, this to just the end goal, that doesn't have to be the entirety of your output. You can use uh, the data that you come up with as you're doing your research. You can, uh, you can publish that data. You can share that data with other people and get credit for using it, get cited just as you would for your finished article. And uh, this is also great for alt metrics. Um, which is just metrics of, uh, outside of traditional scholarly citations, such as being talked about on social media and so on. And just realizing that your data itself is, um, is a worthy product of your research, uh, it really expands it past just getting to the finish line and writing an article about it. So that was the good part. The bad part, it's not actually bad, but it can be a complication if you don't know about it. Uh, funding bodies and journals are uh, pushing researchers to publish their data. Uh, at the NIH, oh, let me move this so I could actually see my notes. Uh, if you, any grant above 500,000 uh, from the NIH must submit a data sharing plan. This can include saying it's not possible because our data has, has so much uh, personalized health information. But if you don't have a specific reason why you can't share your data, you have to be planning this while you're getting, while you're writing your grant proposal, while you're coming up with the grant. Uh, for the NSF, all grants must include a data management plan. 
And certain journals, uh, some of them require materials and protocols be made available. And um, from PNAS, uh, there are instructions for authors, say, to allow others to replicate and build on work published in PNAS. Authors must make materials, data, and associated protocols, including code and scripts, available to readers. And the National Research Council recommends sharing your data. So what this means is that the parts of your research that you might traditionally kind of think of a just a byproduct of that research that isn't worth anything, it can be very important and required in an increasing number of cases. And then there's the ugly. Data as a liability. And here are some quotes uh, exemplifying that. Our postdoc left and now no one knows where the data is or what it means. Where did all that PHI go? And weren't we supposed to dispose of this data? So what can you do uh, to deal with your data? So there's uh, three major things. First one is just understand the data life cycle. Where should you your data be at each part of your project? Uh, next, follow best practices, and I'll go over some of those. And the last one is develop a DMP or data management plan. So let's start with the data life cycle. And there's actually a lot of slightly different versions of the data life cycle, but uh, they're usually they're pretty much all something like this. Uh, so you're going to start with either reuse or plan, depending on if you're reusing data. And a lot of these are pretty straightforward. Uh, you plan how you're collecting your data, then you actually collect it. Uh, the process step involves getting your raw data into a usable format such as um, like getting everything into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, analyzing is actually looking at the statistics and information from that data. Uh, then we have preserve, which I'll be talking more about, and sharing. And even if you don't, um, you're not coming up with uh, with like, discrete data, or you think you're not, there's always going to be data of some sort going into research. And research data management will cover all of these steps for any type of project, no matter what the topic or the type of data you're collecting. All right, best practices. And I'm going to go step by step here. So let's start with planning. And this stage can really make or break uh, how you manage your data. Because if you know what data you're collecting and what you're gonna do with it, that means you won't be scrambling and figuring out things uh, in the middle of your project. So the first things you wanna start with is develop data backup policies. And this includes um, not only backing up digital data, but also things like paper lab notebooks or paper surveys. Uh, if there were a fire in your lab, what would happen to these? Do you have them scanned somewhere? The next very, very important, uh, decide res assign responsibilities for the data. Uh, which person or what position is going to be in charge of data collection and managing that data? If that position is going to change in the middle, for example, if your lab, um, this is an ongoing project, your uh, people in your lab are going to graduate, decide how to pass on these responsibilities. Then when there's, a, when there's one person in charge and you know who the next in command is, then it's a lot easier to keep track of. 
Uh, next is determining potential repositories or journals. So this can go along with figuring out what journals you're aiming for with writing or paper and your publication. Uh, is the journal that you're public that you're interested in, does it allow data publication? Does it require data publication? And what are their guidelines for this? There's also a lot of data specific journals and repositories out there, which I won't get into, but there's a lot of options for what you could do with your data if you want to share it. And finally, you want to determine the budget for data. And this is really important to think of because data costs can be part of the grant. Uh, if you're get, if you're going for a grant, then write in money. Uh, if you want to deposit your data in a paid repository, if you need to pay salary to your uh, whoever's in charge of your data management. And similarly, you can also uh, include in your grant budget um, funding for open access journals. So then there's collection. Uh, you want to start out by defining and listing the types of data that you're collecting and what file formats it will be in. A lot of times this may just be spreadsheets, uh, but sometimes if you're using things like scanned images, uh, saved PDFs, then you'll just want, it helps if you know before you get started what exactly you're collecting. Uh, next is coming up with naming conventions. Uh, for the file names, you always want to include the same information in the same order. So even though you'll have like, you'll have guides that will tell you exactly what all these file names mean and what's in what folder, it's really helpful if you could actually look at a file name and be able to tell exactly what's going on. So you never want to reuse the same name in different folders. In this case, you don't want a short and snappy uh, file name like data.xlsx. Uh, you also want to use underscores and camel case instead of spaces, um, just because different operating systems work better with those. And you want to make sure it's extensible meaning you can include as many uh, within, as many with uh, of these files as you need. So you'd wanna call something 001 instead of just one. And here is an example. So here's an image from, uh, this will be for an image uh, on experiment working with rats. And it starts with the experiment series name, the experiment number, uh, saying that it's a normal heart, the treatment provided, Lipitor, and the slice number, 056. And this will vary greatly depending on your project, but if you just keep in mind, how can I see the information I need at a glance? That's a good place to start. Next, we have a plan. This happens for both planning and collecting your data stages. So you want to make readme files, and those are just going to be text files uh, describing the organization of your research, who's responsible for what, and what instruments you're using. And this is great for just um, basically think that someone could pick up this in, this uh, file and have an idea of where to find everything in this project. Uh, you also want to have specific readmes for the contents of data files. For instance, um, going back to the rat slides, you would want to define uh, exactly what parameters you're using, what all of these aspects mean, uh, what format everything is in, what measurements you're using, and so on. Uh, you want to have a meaningful directory hierarchy 
aka don't have everything in one folder that's like lab you would have uh have something like um the aether rat experiment and then one folder for uh for like each stage of it and so on and finally you have a data dictionary and that's going to explain all these terms that are used in files and folders and just give all the information you need to know uh, if you're working with any of the any specific variables or files. Next, process and analyzing the data. So one important step is uh, you want to preserve your raw data. So you're going to you're going to be changing this raw data into clean data. Uh, but you don't once again, it's not about getting to the end point. The step of getting raw data to clean data, that is also something that's worth keeping. And if something uh, something wrong happens when you're cleaning the data, if uh, you make some sort of mistake or the file's corrupted or you got rid um, or you got rid of some things that you think you should have kept in there, Having the raw data makes it easy to go back and just reclean it. Next, you want to double check your data entry. And uh, depending on if you're using surveys, then different survey programs like REDCap have easy ways to uh, mark survey entries so that you can just say, uh, okay, I need two people to look over each um each entry to make sure it's correct you want to use consistent missing value coding so usually it's going to be a high number like 999888 something that you won't run into normally and finally you want to document all the analyses that you're doing and this um think of this as just another step in making sure you could replicate uh your research Include the steps and the complete software information uh, for the analysis you're doing. And then anyone coming along in the future will be able to exactly replicate what you did or do similar things with their own data. Now, there's, then there's preserving the data. So a lot of these steps are actually going on throughout your project. Uh, it's not the data cycle is not just a straight line, but, and a lot of these you'll come up with uh, during the planning stage and then have them in mind as you're working. So uh, best practice is to keep three copies of data. And this is usually uh, the original copy, an on-site copy, and an off-site or remote copy. And this is something you could work with your IT department to figure out. Different storage options have different pros and cons. Things like personal computers and laptops, network storage, external storage, removable storage, and remote storage. Ton of different factors. Your IT people will have ideas of what to do. Back up regularly. Uh, inc extremely important. You should um, back up data that's hard to replicate. Uh, do that, back that up daily. And that include things, things like longitudinal studies where you need uh, exact time points and so on. Uh, you want to store your final data using stable file formats. And that means you don't want to store uh, store your data in something like um, an Excel sheet because uh, you want to use a file format that can be read by a multitude of programs. And for that, if you just basically Google preferred file formats, you can see what uh, what those formats are, like using a dot text file instead of a word file, and so on. Uh, then you want to determine the duration of storage. 
uh, what are your institutional policies for destroying data? And uh, consider data security. So protected health information, this data security should actually be addressed with the IRB when you're starting your research. And researchers should know who's accessing what files and when. And depending on the network you're using, and again, going back to survey uh, software like REDCap, there are ways to see who is accessing what, who is changing what, so that this data will not get uh, where it isn't supposed to be. All right, and uh, finally, we have sharing and reusing data. Once again, uh, document all the processing needed to ready data. So this is um, if you're using statistical programs or uh, any sort of data cleaning program, just document exactly what you're doing. Uh, save data in stable formats. Like I mentioned before, you want data uh, lossless data compression. For instance, if you save as something like if you save an image as a JPEG, then it's going it's not going to be uh, you're going to lose something within the image when you save it. So you're going to be using like CSV, uh, text files, and so on. And uh, finally, you want to include documentation with enough to make data reusable. And once again, this is making it uh, replicable. And you want to include things like the, uh, the title of the project, who created it, uh, a persistent identifier, such as a DOI, funders, what dates these were collected, what file formats you're using, and so on. Basically, if you came about this on a database, would you be able to do your own analysis on the data? All right, so that is a, that was a very brief introduction to best practices. And now let's go to data management plans. So data management plans are exactly what they sound like. They're taking everything we just talked about, especially in the planning stage, and putting it all into a written document. And this will include data collection, data description, storage, any protection or privacy needs, who, um, how you're sharing data and who can access it and how you're going to preserve it. And uh, this is just a screenshot of an excellent website called dmptool.org. And this has just a great, um, a wizard for making a uh, data management plan. It has every section that you'll want to include in your plan, depending on what research you're doing. And it, uh, it will save this for you. And also it has links to, uh, to guidance from different funding agencies. Like here, we have uh, what the NSF says about data and materials produced and also their own guides on best practices and so on. So if you're interested in, um, in doing research and keeping track of your data, data uh, dmptool.org, excellent free tool to do that. Also, certain universities have, um, uh, have memberships with DMP tools, so the institutional policies will be included in the wizard, which is really nice, but even if your institution isn't connected with it, there you could still just make an entire plan uh, for as much research as you want. All right, uh, and that's the end of my presentation. So if you could complete a survey that we'll link in chat, that'll really help us with um, coming up with our future presentations. And our next workshop is on October 19th on liter literature reviews. So uh, that link will also be in the chat and you can register for that there. And we just generally have a great slate of librarians 
uh, talking about a multitude of different topics. So highly recommend going and signing up for some of these. All right. I think we have a about four minutes for questions. Uh, does anybody have them? All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any, but um, uh, I guess the advice to leave you on is that if you don't know what to do with your data, talk to your uh, talk to your IT people, and they'll be they should be able to tell you how secure your uh, your data is on your network. If there are any plans, also talk to say uh, your research division. And if you don't, if your school doesn't have uh, best practices for data, consider um, advocating for that. 